Couple with newborn twins learns another baby is coming any day. As a mother of four, Molly Schultz had her hands full trying to navigate a set of motherly responsibilities when horrible news suddenly left her infant half brother's well being in question. Despite the insurmountable emotional and logistical obstacles, Molly was determined that nothing would get in the way of her showing up for her brother when he needed her most. One look at Molly Schultz's motherhood blog, Tried and True Mama, shows she didn't shy away from a parenting challenge. The 27-year-old served as the glue of her household, which constantly echoed with the giggles and footsteps of her four curly-headed daughters. Though she and her husband swear they didn't plan it, all of their girls' names have a common theme. Presley, Sawyer, and identical twins Lennon and Halen have the surnames of culturally famous figures. As a full-time mom, Molly developed a parenting philosophy that kept everything in perspective. So no matter how many car rides, tantrums, sticky countertops, or hundreds of repeated Doc McStuffins viewings she had to endure, she could reset and concentrate on what truly mattered. Molly shared on her blog, we live with the intention of a simplistic childhood, not focusing too much on materialistic things, but rather experiences and memories. Along with her husband, Tim, she prioritized family. With each arrival of a new Schultz daughter, Molly's plate got a bit fuller. The young couple moved several times around the West Coast, finally settling in Washington State. But while her own family blossomed thousands of miles away, another part of her family was facing tragedy. Molly's father, Craig Stevenson, was changing diapers and folding onesies for the second time in his life. While Molly was awake with fussy babies, so was her dad several states away. Craig and his wife had welcomed a brand new baby boy on November 13, 2013. All the way over in Michigan, Craig and his wife were enjoying Little Easton, Unfortunately, due to her hectic juggling act with her own youngsters, Molly wasn't able to visit her baby brother as much as she'd have liked. But a tragic, unfair twist of fate sent Molly packing her bags and flying out to Michigan. Shortly after Easton's second birthday, Craig received world-shattering medical diagnosis that put a halt on his plans to watch his baby boy grow up. Months before his 50th birthday, doctors confirmed that Craig was suffering from stage 4 pancreatic cancer. The seriousness of the diagnosis meant he was left with a matter of months to arrange his affairs and enjoy life with his son. The diagnosis hit Molly like a bucket of ice water. Distance kept them apart, but Molly and her dad were incredibly close. She ached for the years that they would lose, that he would miss out on his grandchildren, and even worse, on Easton. Less than 10 years ago, Craig had been pacing the sideline of the fields coaching Molly's lacrosse team. His current chores included chasing his toddler and picking up toys. How could it be possible that a guy with so much life could be dealt such a hand? In the next few months, Craig and his family were gravely preparing for the end of his life. His cancer became even more progressive and the physical toll transformed the once healthy man. Sadly, another tragedy was on its way. Despite learning to answer the phone with trepidation, Molly was still gutted by the words coming across the other line. One day after celebrating his 50th birthday, Craig's wife overdosed on heroin. A horrible hidden family truth could no longer be ignored. Heroin was a secret in my family, Molly wrote in a blog post. It was a secret people tried to bury deep down until its ugly mask came out in full force. Sadly, Easton was home with her at the time. Molly's 85-year-old grandfather discovered him when he stopped by the house for a late morning visit. He was the one who called the EMTs, but sadly it was too late to save Easton's mother. Molly didn't have to think twice. She packed up her twins and boarded a plane. Her mind darted through possible explanations. Was her father aware of his wife's heroin addiction? How could he keep this secret from her? However, the moment she reached the door of her father's hospital room and saw his cancer-devastated appearance, her questions and accusations melted away. Rage and anger were useless at a time like this. Together, the entire family had to stifle their grief the best they could. 
Time was limited and there needed to be a plan for Easton's future. Compartmentalizing the heavy weight of two unbearable tragedies, Molly and her family mulled over the choices for her brother. The group consensus kept landing on one option. Easton would go live with Molly in Washington. Molly and Tim had enough room and with the company of their four little girls, Easton would fit in seamlessly. Plus, Craig would have the comfort of knowing his son was unconditionally adored by his older sister. Once the decision was made, it was as simple as packing Easton's bags and purchasing airfare. Legal steps had to be taken and fast. Craig was growing sicker and the arrangements rested on his signatures. Molly remembered, I tried so hard to imagine the pain and sacrifice my father must have felt in those moments. He knew he wasn't going to live much longer but he sat there with his mind as sharp as ever, signing away his rights as a father. Friday, March 11, 2016 marked the day Craig signed over guardianship of Easton to Molly. By Monday, they'd gotten the good news. The judge had granted their proposal. Craig was so relieved. Oh, Molly, he said, that makes me so happy. I love you so much. However, the very next day, Craig succumbed to his illness. It was almost as if he had been saving his strength to ensure Easton's security, and he could finally rest. This sentiment rang true for Molly. I had heard stories of people hanging on to say goodbye to family members or hanging on to watch their kids graduate, but this was the first time I actually believed in it. 12 days after donning black for her stepmother's funeral, Molly solemnly repeated the ritual to attend her father's services now her biggest physical reminder of her father was the innocent two-year-old orphaned brother that shared her smile. However, in the aftermath of her father's death, Molly received all the paperwork associated with becoming the guardian of her brother. The medical folder was much thicker than that of the average toddler. Paging through it, Molly felt her stomach clench in renewed fury. At the time of his birth, Easton was addicted to heroin. What she had previously believed to be stomach issues was actually a several weeks long opioid withdrawal in the NICU. I was so angry at my dad, I sat in the car until there were no tears left. Molly wished she could turn back the clock and demand answers from her father. As time passed, she made the choice to let her anger go. Eventually, Molly realized the disease isn't a choice and affects even well-intended parents. To move forward, she chose forgiveness. She gave me my son. My father gave me my son. For that, I will be forever grateful. Easton was so little, he had no perception of the awful truth that he'd become an orphan in the span of two weeks' time. In an instant, he was sitting at a crowded dinner table in a brand new house, elbow to elbow with unfamiliar girls who were actually his nieces. Not to worry, the little guy settled into his stable surroundings without a hitch. Once we finally did it, it was like Easton had always been there. How did we ever live without him? Molly blogged. However, the legal entanglements weren't seamless. From Washington to Michigan and back several times, the big family trekked to courtroom appearances to officially adopt Easton. Over a year later, the case was transferred to Washington and a date was set to make him a fully-fledged Schultz. Dressed in corresponding cheery colors, Molly, Tim, their four daughters, and an adorable bespectacled Easton sat down in front of the judge. Rain trickled down outside and Molly took it as a sign from her father to ease her nerves. Although there was nothing to suggest any legal hiccups, relief washed over Molly once the judge ruled Easton was, at last, legally her son. They left the courthouse warmed by beautiful post-rain sunshine. Certainly, the complexity of their biological relationships will forever spark questions. Molly quipped, If we want to get really technical, he's also the brother-in-law of my husband, his now dad. The quirkiness of the family dynamic aside, Molly felt as if there had been hints predicting Easton's future as her son. When her parents were thinking of names, they asked for Molly's opinion. You get three guesses as to which she chose. More auspicious, in Molly's opinion, was the fact that Easton called her mama from the time he could speak. She chalked this up to his overhearing her own children, but with their eventual transition to mother and son, Molly believed it was predestined. 